So the purpose of this video is to remind you of a process you should have learned in pre-calculus called decomposition of fractions, which we all also call partial fractions, which will make some stuff that we do in this class a little bit easier. So the entire idea behind decomposition of fractions is it's sort of the reverse of adding and subtracting fractions. So you know when we actually are adding fractions normally, we would take the two fractions, we would get a common denominator between them. Uh, least common denominator is preferable, but a common denominator is fine. Uh, we would adjust the numerator in a way that we adjusted the denominator to make it a common denominator. And then we would add the numerators of the fraction together and put that over the common denominator. Now, what partial fractions or decomposition fractions attempt to do is to take that process and reverse it. Instead of starting with two fractions we want to add, we want to start with a comp with the sum of fractions that we have and basically break it down into fractions that were added together. So I'm going to walk you through a few examples. I'm going to give you the steps in the first example, the second example, and the third example. We'll follow it all the way through. So I'm going to take this fraction and I'm going to decompose it into simpler fractions. So the fraction is 7x minus 5 over x squared minus x minus 2. So the steps over here are to the right. The first thing you need to make sure is that your fraction is a proper fraction. And for these, what that means is that the degree of the denominator is greater than the degree of the numerator. So in this case, you have a degree on top of 1, degree on bottom of 2. We are good to go. Next thing, factor all your denominators as fully as possible. We'll only have one denominator. So I'm going to factor this. And the factors into x minus 2 in x plus 1. Cool. Now, we're going to set the original fraction, which was this. But I'm going to use the factored form equal to a sum of fractions with individual factors as denominators. So the factors I had were x minus 2 and x plus 1. So the denominators of these fractions will have individual factors in them. So I'll have one factor with x minus 2 and one factor with x plus 1. If I had had three factors in the bottom, I would have had three different fractions. And then on the top of those, to those uh, fractions, we're going to have generalized polynomials of one degree lower than what's on the bottom. So if you look at the denominators that I have here, they're both first degree polynomials that are linear. So the thing I'm going to put on top is going to be a zero degree polynomial, which is basically just a constant. And generalizing it means that I want to use a parameter instead of an actual number there. So on top of that first fraction, I want a constant of some sort. So I'm going to use a letter A to represent that constant. And on top of the second fraction, because it could be a different constant, I'm going to use a letter B. Now, I want to multiply both sides of this equation by the least common denominator, which means I'm going to take this whole thing and I'm going to multiply it by x minus 2 times x plus 1. So on the left-hand side, the entire denominator would go away. On the right-hand side, that first fraction, the x minus 2's would go away and would leave me with x plus 1 times a. And in the second fraction, I'd be left with b times x minus 2. Now, there are a couple of ways to solve for the generalized constant, which would be the next step. Um, I'm going to show you the, like, the sort of down and dirty way. Um, and I'll show you the more proper way sometime later on. So the down and dirty way is that I want this statement to be true for like all values of x. So I'm going to choose some convenient values of x that will allow me to easily solve for a and b. The first one I'm going to choose is letting x equal negative 1. And if you think about when x is negative 1, you'll see why it's convenient to choose that. If I let x be negative 1, the a term goes away and I'm left with stuff that has b in it. So I'm going to write this out, plug in negative 1 for all the x's. So that would give me, let's see, negative 7 plus 5 is negative 2. The a term would go away and I'd be left with b times negative 3, and that's enough to tell me that b is 2 thirds. So if I let a go away, it was easy to solve for b. So now I'm going to focus on making b go away. 
In order to make that happen, I would have to let x be 2. So I'm going to plug in 2 for all the x's. So when I do the arithmetic on this, the b1 goes away, just like the a1 went away in the first one. And I have 3a equals 19. So a is 19 thirds. So basically, the fraction that I started with, 7x plus 5 over x squared minus x minus 2, could be written as the sum of 19 thirds, all divided by x minus 2, plus 2 thirds, all divided by x plus 1. Now I'll tell you, I would never leave this as a stacked fraction, so I would write this as 19 over 3x minus 6, dropping the 3 down to the denominator, and 2 over 3x plus 3. And so that would be the decomposition of this fraction. So let's do it on the long division. So I want to decompose this fraction. So the first thing I notice right away is that this is not a proper fraction. The degree on top is bigger than the degree on the bottom. So the way you deal with this to make it proper, if you had an improper fraction with numbers, you would take the top and divide it by the bottom and then put the remainder over the a divisor, right? So like making a mixed number. I'm going to do the same thing here, but I'm going to have to use polynomial division in order to do that step. Let me give myself a little more room here. That's way too close. So let's see. x squared plus 4 plus 3 going into x cubed plus 3x squared minus 4x plus 1. So if you don't remember the polynomial long division, um, our rhythm is divide, multiply, subtract, bring down. So I would divide the first term of the dividend by the first term of the divisor, x cubed divided by x squared, and that would give me x. And then I'd multiply that result by everything in the divisor, x times x squared plus 4x plus 3, which would give me x cubed plus 4x squared plus 3x. Then I would subtract those. The first things go away. The second thing, I would get negative x squared. And the third, I would get negative 7x. And then I bring down a term. Repeat the process. Negative x squared divided by x squared is negative 1. Negative 1 times the whole divisor would give me negative x squared minus 4x minus 3. Subtract those things. First thing goes away. Second thing, I get negative 3x, and then plus 4. There's nothing else to bring down, and the degree of what's on the bottom is less than the degree of my divisor. So this is my remainder, three, negative 3x plus 4. Um, so I'm going to take that negative 3x plus 4 and write it over my divisor. Now, essentially what I've done there is I've made a mixed number. The x minus 1 is kind of like my whole number part. And the three, uh, negative 3x plus 4 over x squared plus 4x plus 3 is sort of like my fractional part. Okay, so now I'm going to focus on breaking the fractional part down into its simplest fractions. Because the, this part over here, the x minus 1, is a nice pretty whole number part. It no longer needs to be decomposed in any way. So we're going to focus on 3x plus 4. Sorry, negative 3x plus 4 over x squared plus 4x plus 3. So that would make it a 3x plus 4, x squared plus 4x plus 3. And I'm going to decompose that. So I would factor x squared plus 4x plus 3. That's x plus 3 and x plus 1. I would set the original fraction that I have equal to a sum of fractions with the individual factors in the denominator. Each of these factors is a linear, so my tops are going to be zero degrees, or just constants, generalized. I'm going to multiply both sides by the LCD. On the left-hand side, everything would cancel, except the numerator. On the right-hand side, the x plus 3s would cancel for the first fraction. 
and the x plus 1s were canceled in the second fraction. Okay, now I'm going to solve for my generalized constants for my a and my b. I'm going to do that by letting x equal negative 1 to start. And when I do that, on the left-hand side, I would get 7 equals, the a would go away, and I would get 2b, so b is 7 halves, or 3.5. I'd let x then equal negative 3. So on the left-hand side, that would give me 13. Oof, and on the right-hand side, the a would become negative 3. 2 times a, not negative, yeah, the a would have a negative 2 coefficient, and then the b would go away. So that would give me that a is negative 13 halves. And so my decomposition for the fractions would be negative 13 over 2x plus 6. Let me make that a little more legible because that's really messy negative 13 over 2x plus 6, and then 7 over 2x plus 2. But that's just of the fraction. Remember, we actually had a whole number part at the beginning, that x minus 1. So I'm going to add that to the front, and this would be the full decomposition of those fraction, that fraction. All right, one example, and hopefully Fewer glitches this time. Here we go. All right, fraction is pro is proper. We're good to go. Uh, factor the denominators as fully as possible. If you don't remember how to factor a sum of two cubes, shame on you. But x cubed plus one would factor into x plus one, and x squared minus x plus one. The x squared minus x plus 1 would not factor any farther, so we factored that as much as we possibly could. So now I'm going to go ahead and do the decomposition part. So I'd set the original fraction. And I'd set this equal to a sum where each of those denominators has a factor in it. And then I put on top generalized polynomials that are one degree lower than the denominators. So on top of the first fraction, that would again be a constant, so it's a. But on top of the second fraction, my denominator is quadratic. So the thing I'll put on top would need to be linear. And linear things can have both an x term and a constant term. So when I put this thing on top here, I'm actually going to put bx plus c, because it could have a constant term and still be linear. The process then continues just as normal. We'll multiply both sides by the LCD. On the left-hand side, I get x squared plus 3. On the right-hand side, I get a times x squared plus x plus 1. And I would get bx plus c times x plus 1. Right? Now, I've gone through this and I've shown you basically the way to, you know, do it the quick and easy way. This would be a good problem to show you sort of the long and tedious way of doing partial fractions, because if you did it the quick and easy way, you'd only be able to get A. You wouldn't necessarily be able to get B and C. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show this to you, and we'll get accustomed to what it looks like. So the long way of getting these generalized constants is by taking the thing that we have on that right-hand side and going ahead and multiplying it out. like that. And then I'm going to get everything that's on the right-hand side that are like terms together. So if I look at that right-hand side, my x, my x squared terms are ax squared and bx squared. So if I were to add those things together, I would get a plus b times x squared. If I looked at my x terms, I have an ax, a bx, and a cx. So if I added those together, I get a plus b plus c times x. And then if I look at my constant terms, I have an a and a c. So that would be a plus c is my constant term.
Now there's a rule that if two polynomials are gonna be equal to each other, then their coefficients of like terms must be equal to each other. So if you look at the thing on the left, we have an x squared, we have zero x's, and we have a three. That means on the right-hand side, the x squared term, which has a coefficient of a plus b, would have to share the same coefficient as the polynomial on the left-hand side, which is one. Same thing for the x terms. On the left-hand side, that coefficient is zero. On the right-hand side, that coefficient is a plus b plus c. On, and then the constant terms, likewise. So you get a plus c equals three. Now, this is a system of equations, and there are three variables, and we should know how to solve that, but it can be a little bit time-consuming. So I'm gonna sort of throw in the dirty thing that I would have used earlier now, so I can get one of these variables to sort of help me out. So watch this. I'm gonna go back to this right here, and I'm gonna say let ooh, <laughs> x equal negative one. If I let x equal negative one, the thing on the left-hand side becomes four. This would be a times negative one squared, which is one, minus one, which is zero, plus one, which is one, plus negative b plus c times zero. So that entire term will go away. That's enough to tell me that a is four. Notice that both the b and the c went away. And if I tried to find something that would make the a go away, it turns out that x squared plus x plus one has only imaginary roots. So I don't want to be having to plug in i's and getting imaginary that We're outside of the imaginary realm right now. So I'm going to use this little dirty trick to get the thing I know, and then use this four to get the other numbers. So I know that a is four, and I know that four plus b is one. So that would mean that b is negative 3. And I know that 4 plus c is 3. <laughs> so c is negative 1. So the decomposition of this fraction would be a, which is 4, over x plus 1, plus bx plus c, which is negative 3x minus 1 over x squared minus x plus 1. Now, a quick note about why this is useful. A lot of times when we're faced with finding antiderivatives, we might have a complicated fraction as our integrand. This process allows us to take a complicated fraction, assuming that we can actually you know, factor the denominator and turn it into something that is simpler to work with. In other words, a sum or difference of two fractions, which we could then take the antiderivative of separately. So we'll do some examples of that in class.